Good morning, Discovery Church. My name is Lord, and man, I have the privilege, along with my wife, to be the lead pastors of this amazing community. Today, we're starting a brand new series titled Slow Down Silly. When you ask someone how they're doing, what is the most common response that you receive, or what is the most common response that you give? It probably goes something like this. I'm good, but busy. I'm busy is a common response, and not just from millennials. Empty nesters use it, students use it, CEOs, business owners, young marrieds, everyone seems to be busy. Now, busyness is not restricted to a social class, to a gender, to a race, to a country, any specific demographic. When asked how someone is doing, that's by far the number one answer that you will receive. I'm good, but man, I'm just busy. So here's the central thought to this series, Slow Down Silly. It's this, that hurry is the greatest enemy to your spiritual life. The hurry, the hustle, the busyness of life is the greatest enemy to our spiritual lives. And we've got to do whatever it takes to fight it, to push it back, and to do whatever it takes to eliminate it. Corey Ten Boom, who is a famous Christian author from the early 1900s, said this. He says, if the devil can't make you sin, he'll make you busy. Because sin and busyness have the same effect. They both cut us off from God. They cut us off from others, and in many cases, cut us off from our own souls. I get it. Slowing down is hard. Not rushing from one thing to another might feel unproductive. Many of us wear busyness like a badge. We're, we're, we're happy that we're busy. We're happy that we're running around and hustling, and, and we're, we're proud that it demands the respect from our friends and our family. Oh, look at him, or look at her. She is so driven. However, what if We've been compromising our spiritual lives with life's hustle. Mark 8, 36. You may have heard this verse before. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? What is the result of our business? What if the result of our hustle and and our hurry is that we forfeit our soul? As I was preparing for this series, there there are three books that I've taken lots of insight from. One, of course, is the Bible. We always dive into the Bible and see what Scripture says about it and allow the Holy Spirit to speak. And then there's two other books that that I've been reading and, and learning from. And one is The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. And the other one... It's titled, To Hell with the Hustle. And I encourage you, we're going to put the links in our comments section. I encourage you, as we're going throughout this series, would you buy these books? Would you read them? Would you allow some of the things that we're talking about here to sink a little bit deeper? Because these authors have spent multiple hours, almost lifetimes, uh, looking into these topics so we can help eliminate hurry and hustle. There's also a podcast by these two authors. It's called Fight, Hustle, and Hurry Podcast. So today what I want us to do is to set the stage for this series. Throughout the series, we're going to learn practical ways, and some of them are going to be practical but tough, ways to eliminate hurry from our lives. But first of all, I want us to to look, look and recognize and see that there is a problem with hurry. Because most of us, much like myself, probably like the hustle and the, and the hurry and the pace of life. And we may not even see that there is a problem with hurry. But, coined by Dr. Meyer Friedman, he says there's such a thing as hurry sickness. The author of The Time of Cure gives just a couple simple symptoms to help us identify if we have hurry sickness. 
One of them is this. See if you see, self-assess for a moment. See if you have any of these signs of hurry sickness. You go to the grocery store and you stand in line. The one that you think is going to be faster, but the one next to you seems to be moving faster. So you get out of that line and move into the other line. Anybody? I've done it where I've moved out of one line into another line, back into the line that I thought was fast initially because it started to speed up. Or you, you, you pull up to a stoplight and you're counting the cars in front of you and wondering if the lane next to you has less people in it because you can get through it. Or when you try to multitask, or you multitask so much that you forget tasks. How's the self-assessment? Anybody sick? But you're like, I do that all the time, but I still feel fine. You have a t- hard time believing? Well, let's do another assessment that Comer says in his, his book. And this is what his assessment is. It's ten things. Hurry sickness. If you're sick with hurry, you're irritable. Anybody irritable? You're hypersensitive. Restlessness. Work- workaholism. Emotional numbness. Out of order priorities, lack of care for your body, escapist behaviors, slippage of spiritual disciplines, and isolation. Score about eight out of ten. That's where I was, about eight out of ten. See, hurry's out to kill us. Now, hurry might not be a sin, but it does want to separate us from God. I like the title of this book because hurry comes from hell. And it's not a cuss word in the title of the book. Hurry is from hell. And we got to do our part to send it back there. See, hurry is out to, to kill us and to hold, uh, hold us down and to kill us and, and, and to specifically kill what we hold dear, our spirituality, our health, our marriage, our family, our creativity, our uh, generosity, our purpose. To put whichever life value in there, hurry will want to kill it. Maybe you already feel dead in some of those areas. Here's the good news. That we serve a God who is in the business of bringing us back to life. He's in the business of bringing our spiritual life back, our marriage back, our our families back, and a way that we can help, or that we can help bring it back to life is to eliminate hurry. There's a solution. There's a cure for hurry sickness. But it's not more time. I think that's kind of what We were hoping from microwaves and smartphones and click and collect, all designed to give us more time back. Well, I ask you a question. What are you doing with the more time that you have now? Scrolling through social media more, binge watching Netflix, making TikTok videos, shopping, working more. All these technology advancements that we've seen over the last 20 or 30 years to give us more time, hasn't really given us more time. There's a group of people who worked under Richard Nixon during his presidency in the United States, said that the biggest problem of the future would be that there would be too much leisure. That people would only work 22.5 hours a week. Now, I don't know what kind of people they had on that committee, but I don't know if there's anybody only working 22.5 hours a week and say, man, I've just, I have too much leisure time. So the the solution is not more time. Here's the solution. The solution is to slow down, to simplify our lives around what really matters. Because the truth is that nobody has more than 24 hours in a day. You don't have more than 24 hours. I don't have more than 24 hours. So unless we do something, hurry is going to kill us and kill what matters most. 
ask you a question as we just jump in a little bit deeper. If you were to reflect on your life right now in this very moment, would you be proud of who you've become? Or would you be proud of who you're becoming? Not what you've done, not your accomplishments, but who you're becoming or who you're being. See, God created us human beings, not human doings. Or frame it another way. If you were to find yourself laying on your deathbed today, would you have a nagging sense that somehow in the hurry and all the busyness and the frantic activity, you miss what was most important? Just let that sink in for a moment. Answer that question honestly. It's just you. You're at home. Answer it in your mind. In our hurry, in our business, in all of life's hustle, we might have missed the most important thing of all. The most important thing of all is becoming like Jesus. Is to become like Jesus. If we want to become like Jesus... And we want to experience the life of Jesus. We have to adopt the lifestyle of Jesus. And the reality for most of us, me me included, this series is probably going to be the hardest one for me to speak, the hardest one for me to implement into my life. The reality for most of us, up to this point, we can make a change today, up to this point, is that we want the life of Jesus, but we're not willing to adopt the lifestyle of Jesus. We want the life of Jesus, but we're not willing to adopt the lifestyle of Jesus. Comer, in his book, writes this. We read the stories of Jesus, his joy His resolute peace through uncertainty, his unanxious presence, his relaxed manner, and how in the moment he was, and think, man, I want that life. We hear his open invite to life to the full and think, sign me up. We hear about his easy yoke and soul deep rest and think, gosh, yes, heck yes, I need that. But then we're not willing to adopt his lifestyle. Matthew 11, 30, you you may have heard it. You may have seen it on your grandma's wall, bathroom wall, you know, crocheted into something. It says, come to me. All who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest in your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I want to ask you an honest question. I know that this season is, is unique during COVID. Is anybody feeling tired? Anybody feeling weary? And we've probably read this passage before, my yoke is easy. And depending on how much research you've done on this or how many sermons you've heard or how many preachers you potentially heard, you know, what is a yoke? A yoke is a device that actually joins two ox together as they're plowing, uh, plowing farmland. It was, it was a device that would help the ox shoulder the loads together so they could plow through the land. A yoke is a way of bearing the load. And we've probably heard messages about how his yoke is, is light and if, if he comes alongside of you, if you become a believer in Jesus, he'll come alongside of you and he'll take the heavy yoke and, and he'll, he'll carry the heavy parts. And that's all true. He'll carry all the, the weight, the, he'll carry the weight of our lives. 
But when Jesus walked on earth, most people would have seen him as, an, as a rabbi or a teacher. And if you look into the ways of a rabbi or a teacher of those days, Jesus wasn't a farmer. But every rabbi would have had a way of reading the Torah and a set of teachings that would have been what, what they would have called their yoke. A way, a way, a teachings, a way of life, written rules to shoulder life's weight. Jesus would have had a, a, rules and teachings on, on marriage and finances and prayer and sex and conflict resolution, inequality, on racism. He would have had all these, these lists of, of, of things that he would have taught on, a way of life, a, a, a yoke. So when he said, take my yoke up on you and learn from me, I think he was saying, hey, allow me into your life and I'll shoulder some of your burdens. But I think he was also saying, hey, take my teachings. Come and follow me. Learn from me. I think he was also saying, take my way of life. And I'm not going to remove the weight of life, but my teachings my way, come and follow me and I will make you. The weight of life becomes lighter when we follow Jesus' example. So think about it. Contemplate it for a moment. Look at your life. Are you wanting to be like Jesus? Most of us are busy, proud of our hustle, hurrying around, thinking that, or maybe feeling like, well, the world's going to stop if I don't hurry or get to the next thing. Are you wanting to be like Jesus? Jesus always had time for what mattered. He had a margin in his life, and he was probably pretty full. Throughout this series, we're going to look at the life of Jesus and see and learn from him and learn from his lifestyle. So the question is this, as we, as we leave today, if you're wanting to be like Jesus, then we have to follow his lifestyle. If we want to be like Jesus, we have to follow his lifestyle. So for the weeks to come, we're going to dive into what his lifestyle was like. And Jesus never hurried. So today, wherever you are, sitting on your couch, listening from your office, would you say yes to saying, Jesus, I want to be like you. We can't be like him without adopting his lifestyle. Let's pray. God, today as we're making decisions at home, God, you've called us to be like Jesus. You've asked us to be like Jesus, but help us have an open heart, an open mind, and being willing to maybe do some of the hard work to adopt his lifestyle. God, for those individuals today that are saying for the very first time, I'm giving my life to Christ, I'm, I'm saying yes. God, right now, would you just flood their, flood their rooms where they're at and let them know that, that you are the Savior of the world and that as they say yes to you and give the Lordship of their life, that they're on the same page saying, hey, I want to adopt his lifestyle. So God, as we go about our week, would you help us set our hearts for the weeks to come and to start slowing down our lives. Because we need to slow down. We're silly people just needing to slow down. In the name of Jesus, amen.
Thanks again for taking time to tune in to Discovery Church Online. If you made that decision today to give your life to Christ, would you click on the link in the comment section or scan the QR code? There you'll find a connection card, and we just want to make sure we're praying for you. We're making sure we're thinking about you, send you a Bible, help you with the next steps. As you just made the best decision of your life, we don't want to leave you alone.